So as is often the case, um, the show ended and Ashley just dropped this bomb of a quote <laughs> <laughs> from Vincent Harding, who wrote the Beyond Vietnam speech for Dr. King 50 years ago. So I thought we'd spend a few extra minutes here on the internet, online, talking and trying to unpack this quote. So the quote that Vincent Harding wrote in this book, again, was what now? It was, a new America still needs to be born. Let us be the midwives. And what do you make of that? You know, I think it's, <laughs> Dr. Harding always, or Uncle Vince, like, yeah. always was able to get us to dream bigger and have hope about um, this thing. Like he used to say stuff about like, I'm a resident of a, a world that doesn't exist yet. You know, like mm -hmm. all of these, these things that just made it clear that like what is is not at all what's necessary, mm -hmm. <laughs> what could be. Mm -hmm. um, what should be. And, or what should be. Yeah. And like that it's actually on us, right? Like the, the vacuums in leadership, well, if there are vacuums in leadership, then lead, right? Is sort of where he would come from, I think. Mm -hmm. Or if there's a, a vision that is not what a vision that our people deserve, then make a vision, you know, that some of this isn't actually rocket science. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't like, like the, let them be the midwives, uh, right? It wasn't let me be the midwife. Yeah. Um, it was let us be the midwife. Wow. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, that to me means um, that not only is what America is not necessarily the America that I'm going to be in forever. Right. There's a possibility of some transformation, mm -hmm. um, but it's gonna be us, all of us, the collective us of black people, of other marginalized people that come together outside of trans transactional relationships, but mm -hmm. really building kinship that are gonna change this thing. Mark, how do, how do black folk in particular inhabit the space of being a midwife for a, a new and reimagined kind of democracy? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is figure out what makes America, America. What are the things, what are the organizing principles, what are the ideologies and the values that have us in this moment? Because some of them we just take for granted. Like right. we talked about capitalism. Mm -hmm. We talked about an obsession with punishment as a way we create justice. Mm -hmm. All of these things are things we might have to unpack and reimagine. Now, what's fascinating to me is that black folk historically have always been the ones who have had the freedom dream. Mm -hmm. We've always been the ones, whether it was saying, whether it was a vision, a Garveyite vision to go somewhere else, whether it was Elijah Muhammad's vision to build something here, whether it was King's vision of a different relationship between individuals and each other, and both domestically or internationally, whether it was Malcolm's vision. We always were the dreamers. We were always were the ones who gave America a moral compass. We were always the ones that were the stewards. My frustration is that there have been moments recently where we have, largely under an Obama administration, have bought into those very values that we were once fighting against. So now we're saying, oh, well, preemptive war against Syria makes sense. Why? Because mm -hmm. a black guy's president? Nah. Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of return to that moment of being the leaders and the stewards of Americans' morality, but also to articulate a new vision, a new set of possibilities, a new heaven and new earth, as it were. That's right. Yeah. And I think in, in thinking about that and recreating it, um, there's just many new dynamics in the idea of having a black president. Um, and that happened, and now we, and now it hasn't happened. And, mm -hmm. and what does that mean for how we engage with black leadership um, all around the country, mayors, senators, eventually governors um, that we've had and will have? Uh, I think part of the, the sort of challenge domestically, at least, um, has been um, our, the, the, sort of sh the sort of tension we have between wanting to um, support and defend folks who have attained a certain amount of power and still keep the course around sort of the values and the vision that we hold dear. Practically speaking, sort of just how this gets operationalized is that I've spent the last several years as being one of the few organizational leaders that would go out regularly calling on the Obama administration to do things, mm -hmm. regularly pushing the Obama administration. And I'm talking about organizations that have members sure, that, sure. that um, are trying to mobilize black folks to do things and, and getting pushed back from members, but also getting excommunicated from the White House at times and, mm -hmm. and sort of not, not getting, not yeah. getting, I not join, getting join, join the club. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. Not getting invited yeah. and, then, and then getting invited, right? And yeah. then, then being at the table and, and and trying to figure out how do you engage in a space where you're watching other leaders um, congratulate and thank the president um, and spend their time at the table doing that, um, feeling like they had to support the president because the president's success mm -hmm. or black leadership success yeah. in sort of state controlled positions means something for who we are. And so I do think that as a, thinking about the new world, and how we birth it, it will require us thinking very differently about strategy, thinking very differently about tactics, and making ourselves uncomfortable 
um, in a totally new set of ways, because I do think that um, the power that has been built in corporate America for black folks, yeah. in corporate media, and in government is going to consistently and ongoing create the type of tension within the community between the folks that are sort of pushing for aspirational change and those that have felt like they've gotten what they need to get and that the system is working and that and that is um and that i do think is going to be a huge fault line for us yeah. as we move forward I, I, let me just be direct about yeah. it i just do not think mark as currently structured the political apparatus that we have in this country yeah is designed or capable of delivering to us what we need to begin with. I agree. With I, just, I just think I just think it's yeah. it, it, it's not capable of, of doing it's, that because it's not built to do that. Yeah, yeah. That's why the system. We always yeah. say the system not broken is doing what yeah. it's designed to do. Exactly. So what we have to do again is imagine a new set of political realities, a new set of political possibilities, a new structure of representation, and we have to kind of pull back from our allegiance uh, to these parties as they mm -hmm. are, right? I mean, Democrats and Republicans, no, people kill me for voting Green if to be a member of the Green Party. Mm -hmm. But I had, I needed to imagine a, a new set of possibilities, if nothing mm -hmm. else, you know? Now, this po the current possibility doesn't make me happy either, yeah, yeah. But, but I'm thinking mm -hmm. long term. You know, as King said, it's only darkest that you see the stars. We are in a dark moment. I think now we're able to imagine possibilities that even a year ago were unimaginable. But the, but the, but the problem with that, to pick up on Rashad's point, to yours to a certain extent, mm -hmm. the problem with the reality that we face now is that because we were so deferential during the Obama era, we were so deferential that it became detrimental to our own interests. And so the data is clear. It's not about bashing Obama. It's just about what the data says. Black people lost ground in every leading economic indicator category over the last 10 years, eight of which were on his watch. If on top of that, you put Donald Trump and what his policy is about to bring forth, then for some people actually, and I look to you now to say something hopeful and, 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 <laughs> and powerful again, um, but, for, but, for, but for some people, um, our best days are behind us. Uh, and what we are fighting against, which King talked about this beyond Vietnam speech, is a sense of hopelessness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hopelessness. I mean, I, I, like Mark, come from a tradition uh, of by any means necessary. Sure, and, sure, sure. and I think what my elders and ancestors meant when they said that was by all the means, mm -hmm. right? And so I think sort of pulling from both of my brothers that like what we've got to be doing is really having a multi-tactical strategy um, that, you know, recognizes that like, you might be a SNCC and I might be an SELC or you might mm -hmm. be an AACP and I might be a Panther, but like somewhere in that, mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got to be doing something and building some sort of infrastructure. And I think that, uh, you know, if I was going to move us toward hope, that I would say pulling from King's speech, uh, from the words of Dr. Harding, that mm -hmm. like we have to have a revolution. Of values. Um, of values. A revolution of, of values, values. Right? Yes. Um, and I think that we get to define what's valuable yeah, now. Yeah. Like, we just have to do it. And we have to do it unabashedly. We have to do it unapologetically. Um, and so when folks are saying Black Lives Matter or that they're unapologetically Black or that Black trans lives matter, right? Like, those, as we make that a value of our communities, um, with or without the support of the state, to be 100, yeah. to be quite frank about it, um, because what's real is if if the, the America that we've been given, that we inherited, is working exactly how it was meant to be worked, mm -hmm. right? And it can't be reformed, then what, what kind of sense does it make for me to have a strategy that only includes trying to put patches mm -hmm. on the sinking yes, ship yeah. or to use a teapot to put out the burning house fire, right? Um, and so I think that as we define what's valuable, and as we use creative and radical, like when I say radical, I'm talking like what my grandmama would say around, you got to get to the root. Mm -hmm. You got to pull that sucker out or it'll come back mm -hmm. on you. Mm -hmm. um, like radical root transforming ways um, to move towards a land where black folks are valued. Yeah, I'm just not sure. And I'm, I'm not saying it has to be this way, Rashad and Mark, but I'm just not sure that we are anywhere near where they were 50 years ago. Not that they ever achieved this, but we're nowhere near uh, today having a universal understanding of what is valuable in our community anyway. I just think, I think the definition of a revolution of values mm -hmm. is so disparate. Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced though. And I, I wanna- I'm not convinced, yeah. Tavis. Yeah. I, 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 I think, am I wrong about this? I, you might, you, you might not be wrong that there is a disparate that set of values right now, mm -hmm. but I'm also, believing that there always has been. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't stopped us from organizing around a set of core beliefs mm -hmm. and principles. We've sure. never been one voice, but we've always, I mean, and think about, think about. We're not a monolith. Right, but sure. and, think about. And thank God, yeah, I mean, yeah thank yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Think yeah. about 62, 63, when 87 and a half percent of black folk were not engaged in any kind of civil rights resistance, mm -hmm. right? Okay. 
12 and a half percent, in the middle of an American apartheid yes, state, yes. The most, some of the most vile conditions post-slavery we can imagine, most people weren't doing it. So, so I, don't, I don't feel like that moment had any greater possibility for changing the world than this one does. Mm -hmm. I feel like in some ways we are just as invested, just as excited, under different circumstances, mm -hmm. no doubt. But, and resistance will look different. Our values will look different. My fear, though, my biggest fear, to your point, is that even as we imagine what we want the world to look like, that our values will continue to be in the image and the likeness of the current moment. It's hard to dream outside mm -hmm. of the moment. It's hard to dream outside mm -hmm. of the two-party system. It's hard to dream okay. outside of prison. It's hard to dream outside of imperialism. You know, because that's all we know. Mm -hmm. So we have to completely change, our, change the conversation. And that was hard for King, you mm -hmm. know, in, in 1963 as well. So, or 67, even more so. So I think that's gonna be our, our big yeah. struggle. What gives me hope and there is thinking about all of the grassroots folks that are having those on the ground conversations, yeah. right? Like if, if we think about it in the top down way, it's absolutely impossible. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely impossible. Sure. I could retire today, yes. mm -hmm. right? <laughs> yep. But when I think about the role that Highlander in particular plays is like we literally on the daily bring people together, black people together to train them up on how to go home and talk to their people. Right. And so when I'm seeing like people's movement assemblies sprouting out all over the country, all over the world, when I'm seeing communities building up their own communiversities and getting people to do those exercises mm -hmm. where they actually get to flex some vision. I love that, communiversities. Communiversities, yeah. right? Yeah, we yeah, can yeah. do it ourselves, y'all. Yeah, yeah. And so like when I see that happening more and more on the grassroots level, to me, regional and national movements don't happen because we have some like, like just topical network of people that talk to each other across right. states, right? To me, what makes the South a powerful regional movement is that we've got local base building organizations, folks doing direct actions, folks engaging in policy work, right? Doing the work on the ground that are in relationship with each other and that that's influencing regional strategy. And when my, we can do that on the national scale, I think we'll have built something yes. really powerful. I think my, my, my ongoing challenge is how do we bring that to the type of scale right. necessary to the problems that we're actually facing mm -hmm. and to the power that we're facing ourselves up against. And that's where um, my concern for sort of the state of our infrastructure, mm -hmm. for black infrastructure, sure. black organizing infrastructure, you help to build it and, and create a space for it to, to flourish. But when moments happen in communities where there's a moment for um, change and you show up, I show up, we show up, we recognize once again the state of the ways that our infrastructure has been hollowed okay. out over the last several decades. And, and, and you know, the, the final nail in the coffin was Obama in many ways, <laughs> where like he was gonna be our black infrastructure mm -hmm. and he was gonna take our aspirations and there was no outside sort of game. And so I know that I am talking a little bit inside of the system, but I am talking in terms of people believing that their, that their will for a better future can be expressed through democratic practice. And see, that's where Trump becomes useful for me. Yes. Because you could make the case that in 63, we understood access to the public accommodations, access to voting were the two priority issues. So even mm -hmm. if we had disparate political values, yes. We had some very clear goals. Mm -hmm. yes. Right now, keeping fascism at arm's length is, is a clear goal. goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stopping police from murdering us in the street, mm -hmm. clear goal. So it might be possible that this moment, because it's so dire, might allow us so long, to so, <laughs> so, so long as people aren't putting in their sayings and waiting for these four or eight years, God forbid, to pass. And, right. and, and, and right. recognizing, and point, recognizing yeah, yeah. that President Obama was a change candidate, but Donald Trump is a change the rules candidate. Right. And changing the rules is, is actually where we should be as well, but changing the rules for Donald Trump right. is, is much is a much more different type of exercise. Legal rulings might not get um, you know, um, implemented. Policy change doesn't happen the same way. So we can't simply legal our way out of this or mm -hmm. policy our way out of this or nonprofit executive direct our way out of this. This takes a type of movement building that I just think that we've got to think about our infrastructure and our organizing in a completely different way. I'm out of time. In the meantime, in the meantime, 30 second close for each of you, how do you sustain your hope? I sustain my hope by seeing the moments around the country we're winning in this past election cycle, seeing communities rise up um, in the face of bad DAs and, and, and vote out people who had put their communities in harm way and participate in democracy. There's a lot of stories about black people not participating. There were some stories about people flexing their power in new ways. And for me, that sends really new hope. I you sustain your hope, Ash? 
Ditto. And I think that I sustain my hope by living into the legacy of the gospel of the Southern freedom movement mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and black radical traditions that, uh, you know, we don't get into fights. We don't think we can win. And we believe that we can because we're stronger together. Um, and I think being able to do that in a, in a kinship type relationship with folks all across arguably one of the best regions in the U.S., yeah. um, the the place that as the South goes, so goes the nation place, yeah. um, that if we do our work right, we're going to win. And I feel excited about it. A little country pride there. A little yeah. country pride. Yeah, I heard that too. Actually, country Twain pride. came yeah, out too. Yeah, he came out there, yeah. <laughs> That's true. It might be. I have been called a Southern supremacist. There you um, go. Yeah. Yeah. Last word, Professor. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm moved by the international relationships and connections yeah, yeah. in the same way that people in Accra, Ghana were singing We Shall Overcome, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. responding to King's movement From and all Highlander. of our movement. Right, no <laughs> doubt. You know, I'm, I'm standing in Ferguson and we're getting tear mm -hmm. gassed. Yeah. And kids in Gaza are telling us how to wipe out our eyes and make makeshift gas masks. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I travel to the West Bank and they're saying, we want to do what y'all did in Ferguson. Mm. We're screaming, you know, uh, you know, get rid of the, the, the occupation. Mm -hmm. And they're screaming, Black Lives Matter. They don't even speak right. English. Mm -hmm. and they're screaming, that to me is the possibility of what happens when we come together, we connect, and we dream big. Mm. Thanks for tuning in to this extended uh, conversation, this special conversation, as we look back on Dr. King's Beyond Vietnam speech 50 years ago with three people who weren't even born 50 years ago. But it just shows you that the struggle continues.